This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Okay, everybody. Uh, looks like the, We're uh, live? we are live on Discord. Hopefully everyone can see both our screens Hi. and hear both of us. So give me a uh, indication if you were in the audience because this is a slightly new uh, technologically uh, techni bleh, technical pipeline that we haven't tried before. So there's just a few new pieces to it. Trying to upgrade our game, but of course we're testing it out on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> so we definitely tested it out a little bit before, but um, how's the lag on the video and the audio and everything? You can hear both me and Aradia. Um, Hopefully everything there is working out. Yeah, most of us like I don't know. Give us a screenshot of what you're seeing, just so we we, we know what's happening. So far, everyone <laughs> seems to be. I get, I'm getting thumbs up and waves and stuff in the in the thing. So yeah, two two people. How do you see the video on your? I don't know. Yeah, this, MK, how you would see the video on your phone? You're definitely gonna have to turn it on on your phone. I'm not sure the the way to do that. Okay. Like it might, <laughs> it might be like some like data thing. I I don't know. Mobile tends to be more persnickety for reasons. Um. Sweet. Okay, sweet. That's what we look like. Oh my god, we look so officious. <laughs> like I don't know why. I just feel way more like oh I'm professional. Okay, that's what we're doing so. Um, we are going to be trying to put these videos up on YouTube um, so that people can watch them. Um, just basically, you know, hey, let's ride that YouTube train, folks. Let, let's choo-choo, right? So this is getting recorded, um, and I'm just going to hopefully have audio for it and, and put that up. Um, I hope I don't run into any problems. Yeah, no, it's been a minute, guys, since, I mean, we did the, the um, spoiler con recording, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But the last time we sat down was what, like early, early September. September? Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we took a very deliberate break, which was very necessary, mm -hmm. and reset a lot of things. A lot of spoons were reset, which was good. Um, and then we did SpoilerCon, which yeah, we're going to talk about next. And now we are back doing. The next book and we're both very excited to be back doing Definitely. this because it, i mean it was a good break it was a necessary break it was long enough that we were both antsy to get back to it like is the break over yet we're, we're ready to go i miss talking to you so, guys so yeah so we're very excited to be back and making the content you love and being excited about the path of daggers but first, we should probably talk about SpoilerCon. Yeah, let's talk about SpoilerCon. First, I want to apologize. It sounds like the heating element is on. I, I've done a lot to get rid of fans and in my computer system. Um, but, of course, then it turns out that uh, winter turns on and the, the heat uh, is, like, right behind my office. So I can't get away from them, folks. Fans are everywhere in my life. It's just, just part, of, part of living. <laughs> anyway, uh, SpoilerCon was amazing. Guys... I had a blast. We had, what, 34 people, I think I counted, when the, the final total was I, there? That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. 34 people. Um, and I don't even know how many managed to come online. I still haven't gotten that number. Um, no, I didn't look either. No. But <laughs> I know that it was really fun. I know that I had an absolute blast. I know that, um, like, is it October yet? Like, are we going to make that a hashtag? <laughs> like... Um, yeah, SpoilerCon was, I think, a raging success. Um, uh, it well, didn't hurt that we raised 3500 bucks for uh, Books to Prisoners. And no, no, we broke our record again, again for how much money we've raised. Um, excellent prizes in mm -hmm. that. You know, and I'm very excited that uh, a bunch of people were able to get cool stuff. You know, that's, that's also really exciting. Um, but... Yeah, the whole the weekend. I, it's, it's hard to describe. It is, it's always hard to describe what it's like to get a bunch of Wheel of Time fans together. Because unless you've been there, it <laughs> feel it just it sounds hollow. It's one of those things where it's like there's a camaraderie there that you can't you can't find in a lot of other places. And yeah, I've never experienced it anywhere except SpoilerCon. But this is my fourth SpoilerCon, and every time it just gets more and more comfortable and. It's just, you, especially the people I know on Discord, like it's really fun to meet people that I haven't met before. 
but it's also really fun to meet people who I know quite well yes. through Discord. Yes. Like those are two different kinds of meeting people and they're both really, really fun. Um, but yeah, we had great events. We had downtime <laughs> between events, which was really nice. Um, the food carts that were right around the corner were extremely popular. I had really good food there and I saw multiple people going multiple yeah. times. No, but we also, we catered lunch and catered dinner and I feel like those were both, both like very tasty and very filling and every it, you know, for Saturday, it kept people in the hotel so they were able to do all the events and socialize without going anywhere. So we were able to feed people. Um, I, I think the there, were, there walks. were walks. There was the venue was great. This is, you know, I think we've talked about yeah. before that the venue has been very limiting to us when we've done it both either in an Airbnb or a hostel without a lot of good sort of meeting spaces yeah we upgraded this year and it paid yes, off it in the enjoyment of the ep of the mm -hmm. event you know and, and one thing that i really it's it's unfortunate that i do feel like i don't necessarily get to experience all the socialization and all the fun um because i'm doing a lot of the work to make the con happen you know and i think i think you and i um and, and a few other yeah. people um, especially those folks on the planning committee uh it maybe experienced that a little bit just where like <laughs> Man, there were so many times where I wanted to go hang out, but I either had to get ready ready for the next panel or do something technical or um, just get the rest while I could. So, uh, Yeah, but again, one more massive shout yeah. out to our planning oh committee God. that absolutely made it happen. Totally. People across the last two years made this event happen. Even those that weren't with us for the event as it happened put in labor before because of the way that 2020 got scuttled. We had a huge amount of help making that happen and just one more huge shout out to everyone who was on the planning committee and everyone who volunteered mm -hmm. also which was like half of the people um it's definitely a community event it takes a village to have a podcast gathering definitely i, I guess <laughs> and i do plan uh, the the videos will get moved over to the watt spoilers youtube channel if you want to rewatch them we're just um we had to sleep for a couple of days afterwards, and it turns out all the things I was planning on doing in the, the three days after the con um, just turned into, oh, my God, I need to go to bed. <laughs> yes, uh, for sure. But there will be videos definitely. Um, in the near future. Mm -hmm. And if you have the YouTube uh, links for the live videos, if they're in your search history or um, I th the Discord channel closed, but if you still have that email, you can just click on them and go back and rewatch the live videos. Yeah, yeah, but um, and no, no post con crud so far. So far, you know, yep. no, everyone seems healthy. So far, it's been a few yep. days, and I haven't heard anyone complaining of sniffles of any variety. So yeah, we're past the like um, the five day limit for when most most things incubate. So we should start hearing about that soon if we're gonna hear anything. But yeah, um, yeah, you know, I think everyone we were fully vaccinated. Everyone was actually was really really good about wearing masks in groups and inside. Mm -hmm. um, and we do hand yeah. sanitizer and masking. Yep. There was lots of and that. ventilation, right? We we made sure that at least in the con suite we had a, a door open. <laughs> See, because mm -hmm. yeah, I think people underestimate how important ventilation is. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure, and yeah, I there is a survey that I'm in the process of writing, um, and I'm we're, we're going to send it out. But just from anecdotally hanging out with people. Uh, I, I think it went really well. It's the first event I've ever organized, and I'm very proud of how few fires and blood were shed. A few fires were set and how little blood was shed uh, in getting this event to go. It went really well, and I'm grateful to everyone who showed up and participated for making that a thing. Mm -hmm. And everyone who donated, because, good Lord, that was a lot of donations. Mm -hmm. Uh. Charmy asked the reason why do we close the server so shortly? Um, yeah, just because it's it, it was an event based server, and when the event's over, we closed it. You know, it's very much like just like the ballroom yeah. got closed off, and all the snacks were closed off. Also, the Discord server yeah. was closed off. We wanted to give the digital attendees that same cut off experience <laughs> of being in person and being kicked out of the. It's event. over. Go home. You can't stay here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like I said, hopefully, you know, if if you had any important links or anything, they should have been in the email. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so and and that way also it drives people back towards the SpoilerCon 2021 channel in um, the the Watt Spoilers Discord. So that sort of drives that back, and people can talk about it. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's and uh, there there will probably be a SpoilerCon 2022. 
we're we're pretty pretty committed to that, even though we were definitely talking otherwise before the event. <laughs> but listen, it went really yeah. well. The anxiety just had to have its right. way in the run up. It was just anxiety is going to do that, you know. But here is where I will shout out: if you want this to happen again in the future, we need help. Um, this has been a lot yeah, of work. It's true. For a lot of people, and a lot of them have said, that was fun, that was, I'm glad I did that, but I'm not doing it next year. That means I need more people to step up if we want to keep doing this. So here's my plea. Um, if you want, you know, we have a lot of things that are set up, a lot of things that are established, um, a lot of things that don't have to be rearranged this year. So I do think the work involved is going to be less, but uh, we need a significant number of people to make a significant time commitment to planning SpoilerCon 2022. So if that's something you feel like you can do, please send me a message, send me an email, send me uh, something on Discord. Um, we also you know, are willing to have different roles, people who just show up on the day and volunteer on the time. Uh, volunteer at that moment um, or people who just want to take on a single task but uh, we really do need some folks to step up and, and and help us you know because as I was saying I, it's you can't host and run a party and do the tech stuff um, it's it's just all too much we need we need many people so yeah you you have our email write us mm -hmm. if you're interested and we will get back to you accordingly as we get our ducks in a row um, to think this through. We'll probably send out a couple more calls for action on mm -hmm. that. But uh, yeah, here you go, guys. People here, you heard it first. <laughs> <laughs> People here live heard it first. Uh, we need help because we want to make SpoilerCon 2022 happen. Um, so anything interesting happened to you in the last month besides the con? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I mean, there's the part where my living room is being torn up to put in a hearth. Um, I have licensed and bonded contractors in my family who are doing above board modifications to the house that I am in debt for. So I feel like a serious adult. Um, and they're picking out stone today to place into the hearth. Brandon and I picked the kinds of stone we wanted. And so then they went to the place today and are actually picking at these specific flagstones that will be used. Um, apparently it's about 3,500 pounds worth of rock. <laughs> just so, a few pounds. Just a few. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the exciting thing for me is half my living room is taped off into construction zone and there will be a wood stove with a beautiful handcrafted stone hearth, um, in there when it all comes back down so that's pretty exciting um yeah what about you um i was cooking yesterday and was uh pan frying some duck and it splattered some oil on my forehead and i got a nice deep burn right in the center of my forehead so that's, Owie. Yeah, that's a, that, i got home from work and looked in the mirror and i had a big blister right in the center of my forehead oh. from where the oil had just like hit and burned it was that was bad that was not fun so uh busy night yeah that was <laughs> oh so yeah, the, the dark one has touched me it's literally like just right in that spot oh. <laughs> um but yeah i didn't even really it was like i kind of like felt the splatter and was like ah oh, that kind of hurts and then like it felt kind of like a sunburn you know on your forehead but when you're moving you know you don't think about it at work much and then it's not until I got home and really looked in the mirror and was like, oh, that's that's going to leave a mark. Has left Has a Has left mark. a mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so don't don't look into the fryer. Cook. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a little dangerous sometimes. It can be. Yeah, fryers are, are yeah. very dangerous. For to sure. be honest, I would have actually preferred a, fryer, a deep fryer because at least then you have some protection. The problem with this is I was pan frying in a pan just on a stove top mm, and so it was splashy. just splattering yeah, yeah they didn't have the high walls to protect you so uh, we do try and get it hot and then throw it in the oven um and that way the oven itself will protect you from some of the the, the splashing but I, I i was reaching for it to move it to the oven when it decided to spit a healthy glob of 
uh, canola oil in my face. Ugh. Ouch. Yeah. yeah, cooking is is dangerous just in general. Yeah, I mean, I don't know any cooks who don't have significant numbers of cuts and burns on their hands and arms and often yeah. faces. Hot oil, yeah. boiling water, sharp knives. Like it's just it's slippery it's floors. Nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and just and a lot of weight sometimes. Sometimes you're picking up 50 pounds of boiling liquid in a pot, you know? Um, yeah. That's just, it's, yeah, not, you don't want your mind to wander. You want to be very, very cognizant yeah. of all hazards and you will still get hurt. You have to be okay with getting hurt. Yeah, there's a certain amount of like, yeah, you get burned a little bit, but that's fine, right? Like, yeah, I don't have any feelings in the tips of my fingers, but that's expected, right? You know, that's... <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a, hazard. a hazard. That is a workplace yeah. hazard. I got to tell you, it's a fun party trick to pick up really hot things with your bare hands. Because you're like, yeah, I just don't mm -hmm. feel it anymore. Like, I really have burned the tips of my fingers enough times that there is a certain amount of, like, callous numbness built up in there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, my contractor friends, their calluses are pretty burly for picking up sharp things, mm -hmm. hot things. Like, yeah, if they didn't work for a while, the calluses would come off and they'd have sensitive hands underneath. But the calluses are truly work tools at mm -hmm. this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then just having a good knife. That's my other keep. Here's the thing. Everyone puts emphasis on, on having a good knife. I think that's wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. You need a, a good knife is helpful. But what you need is a decent sharpening stone. You can have the crappiest mm. knives in the world, and if you can sharpen them on a regular basis, they will work beautifully. The only thing a good quality knife does is allow you to sharpen it less often. But so many people buy these ridiculously expensive knives, let them get dull over the course of a couple of months, never sharpen them again, and all of a sudden you have a hundred dollar you know knife that's and then they go to the store, buy some shitty shitty ten dollar knife, and wonder why they're brand new crappy ten dollar knife is better than the thousand dollar or hundred dollar knife that they you know bought from the fancy yeah, store and it's like yeah. you have to sharpen it you have and and here's the thing that fools everybody that metal rod that you get in your kit does not sharpen your knife it strops mm -hmm. the knife it straightens the metal on the tip to sharpen the knife you actually have to remove metal you actually have to take a layer off and that needs a stone so here, you know, one, sharpen your knives, and two, what you're doing probably isn't sharpening your knives. <laughs> no, that is honing, that is honing them. them. Yeah. That is stretching out the time between sharpenings right. and maintaining the edge bef between sharpenings. Right. It's... You should still definitely do that, right? Like Yes. It's very mm -hmm. important, knife maintenance. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the sharpening is... It's very, very mm -hmm. important. We have a very good knife that Brandon went through culinary school for just one term, but it was enough to get the knife set and like learn basic equipment yeah. care. And yeah, he complains bitterly about how he doesn't have a whetstone. And therefore, all of his honing is like he has to hone it sometimes during cooking because it just dulls out again so fast. It's a really good knife, but we have never managed to get around to getting it sharpened. And yeah, that, that metal rod, it, it only does yeah. so much. It really does. No, if there's no edge to straighten fact. out, it won't do anything for you. Yeah. So. Um, so that metal rod thing is what we're talking about. That's that's the honing. So I guess strop. Yeah, this is the honing. Stropping is technically on leather or on like a, a wood or something like that. That's usually super soft. Um. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's important in between sharpenings, but sharpening is like add something you do with a stone. Or just take to someone like there are people who yeah. sharpen knives and scissors like that is a craft niche thing that exists and generally if you get your knife sharpened it's anywhere between two to five dollars to get a knife sharpened um serrated ones are a little more expensive right like it, yeah it's essentially like getting a brand new knife for a couple of bucks do it right yeah, yeah, it's completely mm -hmm. worth it. It's it's a tool. It's a very important tool. And if you're going to cut yourself, which is where this conversation started, if you're going to get hurt in a kitchen with a knife, you want it to be with a sharp mm -hmm. one. Well, and, and it's even more than that because you're less likely to cut yourself with a sharp knife, right? Because mm -hmm. usually when you cut yourself, it's when you go to cut that tomato or that whatever that round thing is that your knife skitters off of. And instead of cutting into that round thing, it skitters off and cuts into your flesh, right? And because it's yeah. dull, it's going to make a jagged cut if it's sharp it just never you know and 
it's the amount of force too, right? If you have something that's dull, mm-hmm. you really got to push. If you have something that's sharp, you don't use a lot of force, which A, saves your hands and arms, but B, also um, is much less likely to go uncontrolled flying into your hand. Yeah, and with less force if mm-hmm. it does. Like, it just it brings everything down. And yeah, Rob Rob, Rob Rob, yeah, Rob Rob in uh, Discord points out, it's called a steel. That's the word yeah. for it. It's a steel. I call it a steel. In the kitchen, we call it the steel. But that's one of those things where when you're like, oh, get me the steel. And people who don't know what you're talking about are like, you mean a piece of steel? Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, fair yeah, enough. It's just, it's yeah. hard. To, it, I use that, that terminology every day in the kitchen. Yeah. But, if, you, you know. if you use culinary terminology, mm-hmm. it's a steel. But yeah, um, it's important. Maintenance of tools is important. Mm-hmm. Especially when they're potentially going to injure you and or make your food. So, shall we talk about? <laughs> With no segue no, whatsoever. No, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess you know. Uh, to circle back to cutting. spoiler yeah. con. <laughs> <laughs> right. One of the last thing we did in spoiler con is we the last, the event. last event of spoiler con is we actually started Path of Daggers, um, and we did the first segment, um, just basically the uh, Borderlanders segment of the prologue of Path of Daggers. And so we're here today to finish up the second half of that prologue. Um, In which Varen does her compulsion yep. thing and Moradin plays chess. Such a good chapter. And yeah. I do have to point out one thing. Um, we Path of Daggers, uh, P.O.D., uh, we're making a podcast about Path of Daggers, and that makes us podcasters. <laughs> Path of Daggers casters. So, um, yeah, podcasters. <laughs> Like you told me it. I knew it was coming, but like <laughs> podcasters. Yes. Yes, yes we are. Path of daggers. This is a this is a pun I can't even punish you for. <laughs> like I, I, just, I, I'll I have to let it I'll go. Thank you for that. <laughs> this is your one this book. One. <laughs> You've already spent it. <laughs> I thought it was one per chapter. Uh, or it's like Uno. It's like one every other chapter. Yeah, yeah. it's totally like Uno. It'd be once every other chapter. I, I'll half pun halfway through, and I'll be like, "Well, that's that, 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 oh, okay." Let me. Um, uh, Charmy, you're asking me what that is, and I that picture is so crappy. I have no idea. It doesn't look like anything that is in my kitchen, for what it's worth. A stone hexog. Well, if, if it's a stone knife, it's probably, or if it's a stone bar, then it probably is a sharpening stone, depending on. But you know, I don't know what the grid is on it or what you know. So. Yeah, I agree with Margot. I cannot believe we're here. I can't believe we're here. I cannot believe we're on Path of Daggers. Like, how? How did we get here? <laughs> We are in episode 390, and we're starting Path of Daggers. Oh, that's crazy. Second, the second half of the series, right? Like that's what we're that's what we're on. Is we've done the entire first half of the series. Yep. And so that's what we're here for. <laughs> for the second half, we're here for shit hitting the fan. And as and I just I love that we are going. <clears throat> if we do this right, we'll hit episode 400 right before the show comes out. And then the show's going to come out in the middle of this thing. And, you know, we've talked about just how we're going to take a pause. But, I mean, there's so much going on with the show right now. Um, We're going to shift to the show. We're not really going to stop working. We're going to shift what we're working on. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, 400 and then the show and then back to the second half of this book. Um, Which we will get started any minute in here. uh, So this is the prologue of Path of Daggers. Um, our symbol is the, the wheel and what was it? Deceptive appearances, I believe was the chapter title. Yes. Yes. Deceptive appearances. And we start out in Varen's head. Once she was sure that to Turana, once she was sure that Turana could sit up on the cushion unaided, Varen rose and left the slump white sip sister sipping water, trying to sip anyway. 
Tarana's teeth chattered on the silver cup, which was no surprise. The tent's entryway stood low enough that Varen had to duck in order to put her head out. Weariness augured into her back when she bent. She had no fear of the woman shivering behind her in a coarse black woolen robe. Varen held the shield on her tight, and she doubted Tarana possessed enough strength in her legs at the moment to complete leaping on her from behind, even if such an incredible thought occurred to her. Whites did just not think that way. For that matter, in Turana's condition, it was doubtful she would be able to channel a hair for several hours yet, even if she were not shielded. Um, I'm going to read the next paragraph, too. Okay. The Aiel the camp... The Aiel camp covered the hills that hid Kyrian. Low, earth-colored tents filled the space between the few trees left, standing this close to the city. Faint clouds of dust hung in the air, but neither dust nor heat nor the glare of an angry sun bothered the Aiel at all. Bustle and purpose filled the camp equal to any city. Within her sight were men butchering game and patching tents, sharpening knives and making the soft boots they all wore, women cooking over open fires, baking, working small looms, looking after some of the few children in the camp. Everywhere, right-robed Gaishine darted about carrying burdens, or stood beating rugs, or tended pack, house, pack horses and mules. No, hawker, no hawkers or shopkeepers, or carts and carriages, of course. A city? It was more like a thousand villages gathered in one spot, though men greatly outnumbered women, and, except for the blacksmiths making their anvils ring, nearly every man not in white carried weapons. Most of the women did, as well. And so that's just uh, a description of Varen looking at the great Aiel camp that is surrounding Rand outside of Kyrian. Yeah, we're popping into what's been going on for her, right? She's in the middle of work. Mm -hmm. She's in the middle of a city. We're just like, quick, scene set. This is what's been happening. And there's a line a little farther along about Cat Swain arriving three days ago. Okay. So that also sets us in our positionality in the timeline. So has she realized, has Rand returned yet in her mind from being wounded? I don't think she knows about the wounding. I don't think she does either. At all. I think she's completely out here doing her thing with the sisters um, as all of that happens and she doesn't get word of it until long after the fact. That makes sense, that she's basically lost in the city of people and hasn't had a chance to talk to a lot of the folks. Right, because she's put a bunch of effort into getting herself into this position and focused on interrogating the sisters, which means that she's not going to get a lot of access to anything else. Like, this is all of her privilege points are being right. spent on this. There's a lot of talking around what's going on in this chapter. Varen isn't telling you what she's doing. She talks around it a lot. Because, I mean, Jordan likes to maintain, if you're reading through this, the is she or isn't she Black Aja. Mm -hmm. That's like, this whole segment is just such a masterclass on making me go, wait, Somehow we had a long chapter from her POV where we got a lot of her opinions, and yet we still don't know if she's Black Aja. What the hell, Robert? Like, that's good. That's really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, and she's doing different things to each woman, right? Like, it's so she's so many layers deep in her own thing that you really don't you, you couldn't get one straight story. No. What she's doing is so complex. There is no one straight narrative of what she's doing. And it's it's wonderful. Because she's doing a lot of different things all at the same time. And she's setting them up to motivate themselves mm -hmm. to fulfill very specific instructions. She's like, you have to find a way. I'm just telling you that you have to achieve this end. You have to figure out how that happens. Which means that she's setting in motion things she can't know or control. That's a good point. That's a good point. What do you think is going on with these constant showing her the Daco Vale? I, I think it might be a bit of an intimidation tactic. But I don't know. It doesn't, it, that seems like the wrong read to me. But it is a very large city for her to have the frequency of seeing them that she is. The, and she's only seeing like one every single day. 
So uh, it does. It makes me think that they are shaming the Aes Sedai by showing them to their peers. See, now that I could see. That it's not... Being like, look at how Varen is living versus how you're living. Observe this difference. Right. Sorry, my game was too high. Um, yeah, though, basically saying like, oh, and also like, you are shamed, you are Daco Vale. Here, look at your former peers. They're going to see you as Daco Vale. They're going to know you're Daco yeah. Vale, right? Like, dot song, dot but song. Yes. I'm sorry, I've been saying Daco Vale instead of dot song. <laughs> But yeah, no, for sure. I because it didn't it didn't seem to me like they'd be trying to show that to Varen, but yeah, using Varen to shame the Dot Song, and even just the other prisoners. I mean, it makes sense. I guess they're only Dot Song, and then the one who's being rescued from being stilled. I guess there is no in between. So yeah, yeah, that makes sense. They're using Varen as a punishment rather than trying to threaten Varen. That's yeah, but I think Varen's just misinterpreting that. Yeah, because it feels like she's reading it wrong. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't sure how to read it right. But I agree with how you have it. Uh, she speculates about the hierarchy of the wise ones. Which, I mean, again, that's one something that's never entirely clear. Even when Avienda says, like, it, it pretty much boils down to when you assert yourself as correct, you are correct. And if you assert yourself more forcefully, so other people listen to you. And that's why everybody listens to Cerulea, because no one <laughs> um, no one ever can assert themselves more strongly than she does. She's always correct. Yeah, it's and it's flexible, which is the main reason why Aes Sedai have a hard time grasping it, mm -mm. is because it is dynamic and flexible. And Aes Sedai, Sean Chan, uh, the White Cloaks, like they all have extremely fixed hierarchies where you get appointed up or down. The Aiel have a much more organic, free-flowing, like, whoever is leading currently is the leader. And they have a way of dealing with that that the other cultures just don't. And to a certain extent, us as Americans have no fucking concept of how that could work. So Robert Jordan's writing maybe leaves us a little bit scratching our heads because it, it's flexible. Right. That's just what it is. You have to be living in it, and then you will know. Dynamic politics. Yeah. Um, I like that she has picked out Soralia as the wise one that she needs to work with because that's what Cat Swain does as totally. well. Is like if I can get Soralia on board, the one who I see as an equal, then I have a base of, to work with. And Varen, who is working for the same ends, has picked Soralia out the same. It's like no, really, Soralia is is the goat mm -hmm. of the IU. And, and Varen's about to help her out. She's about to hand her a list of uh, weaknesses or fears about all of these these women that have. Yeah. yeah. I think that's so interesting how she completely throws her wetlander culture under the totally. bus to the Aiel. <laughs> She's like, oh, I know what they're asking for, which it's going to be stuff like naked. being naked in front of mm -hmm. men. Like the Aiel just don't see that as embarrassing. And they need someone like Varen to essentially code switch for them. And be like, for you, useless labor is shaming. For us, it's physically exhausting. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's there's a translation to happen there. And Varen is, mm, she is turning to, right. she's a traitor to her wetlander uh, conf confederates. And, and I bet a lot of the wetlanders, they might have, like, easy labor that the ILC is shaming because it's something servants might do. Whereas the, the uh, I said I is like, well, yeah, I'll sit here and, you know, fold napkins, whatever. That's nice and easy out of the sun, right? No problem. And when they're actually trying to be punished, whereas, you know, an Aiel would see that as, like, the worst punishment ever is, like, oh, my God, I have to fold these napkins that they're just going to, like, unfold when, when I'm done? Like, that's, right. that's ridiculous. Um, and so that they're going to avoid the, quote, unquote, easy punishments from now on, I think, is also a part of, part of the list. It's not yeah. just that the punishments are getting harder, but a lot of the easy ones are going to be, like, yeah, that's not a punishment anymore. Don't. Right. Yeah, exactly. And Soralia asked Varen. So that's almost like Soralia feeling at Varen to be like, hey, are you a useful ally? Are you someone I can actually mm -hmm. create alliance with and work with? Like, will you help me out here? And then Varen's like, in spades. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and she justifies the fact 
that she's doing this by saying she has her purpose, right? Which we know is, of course, tracking down the Black Hotjaw, which is completely unknown at this point if you're reading this for the first time. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's one of the things that, that made Varen so intriguing to study was be like, what is her purpose? She's so driven. She knows she's doing something. And we were, I think, I mean, I was certainly blindsided by the whole triple agent thing. Um, so I just never knew what her purpose was. And, and this, I honestly think a lot of the speculation about the purple Aja comes from this POV, right? Mm -hmm. The idea yeah. that there, and, and I'll explain what the purple Aja is. Um, the idea that within the black tower, within the white tower, there exists a secret society of dark friends trying to take the tower down and cause uh, the dark one to win. That there's actually a secret society in the White Tower that maybe has no longer sworn the oaths, but is working for the side of the light um, and has violated the oaths in order to try and make the creator win. And that, that would be someone like Moraine and, and Varen would be part of that that purple Aja. It turns out it's only Varen. It turns Varen out it was only Varen. Who's doing <laughs> yeah. that. But it's a good theory. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, this definitely, I, I would say I was not, I didn't see it coming with her reveal, but this chapter made me wonder. Mm -hmm. I was just like, she has her purpose and her mission. I was like, that's, I, I at the time, I don't know what I thought exactly, but it definitely made me not particularly surprised mm -hmm. when the reveal happened. I was like, holy shit, no way. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like everything made sense in one second. And that definitely this piece is a huge linchpin in that cascade of thoughts. Which leads into uh, the end of the next paragraph says, keeping secrets from your warder was far more difficult than keeping them from strangers. Now we know canonically that Tomas is a dark friend, right? Like mm -hmm. she talks about how he went home, you know, he also took poison and he spent his last hours with his family. He was a dark friend who wanted he out. Wanted out. That was right. how she found him in the first place. This does feel like, though, she is keeping the compulsion from him and that maybe he's not. He wasn't written to be a dark friend at this point. That maybe he was, you know, just a normal warder and she was hiding the fact that she was a dark friend from him. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even with the canonical thing, it's like, who knows how much she ever truly trusted him. Sure, because he is another because... dark friend dark friends right. <laughs> right like they might have had a good professional working relationship but there might have been some secrets that she wasn't mm -hmm. willing to share um like the fact that she's using compulsion right or he might not trust her if she if he knew she could do that to him right. i mean i guess she couldn't really do it to him because it doesn't really work on men the way that she's worked it out and dark friends mm -hmm. so the mistrust thing but yeah it's it definitely does make you wonder about him you have no idea is he a dark friend for realsies and like at this point even if you guess maybe she's a dark friend like this tells you nothing about him no or maybe she just it follows a policy of secrecy unless you have to know it's a need to know basis and he doesn't need to know definitely not so yeah, that's that's what it turns out to be i think but um and then we get this other excellent line where she says um 71 years had passed since she had last made a serious mistake and again, we know what that oh was. My God, speculation <laughs> that went into what was that serious mistake, and we tried to track down seventy-one years ago. Um, but yeah, mm. I mean, that is to be honest. That's when she became a dark friend. That's when she started investigating the dark friends and stumbled into a meeting and was given the choice: um, join or die. Yep, yep. It was seventy-one years ago to the day. To the day. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Damn you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, she talks about her curiosity, getting her in trouble, like it, it, that she was researching dark friends and it was clear that she was just, yeah. she, you know, was doing research and, and probably stumbled into a, uh, a meeting. Um, and it was yeah. like, oh, yep, I'm here to be a dark friend. I meant to, yeah, do, I that. Meant to do that. Yeah, I just re-listened to that chapter because uh, for the spoiler con silent auction, I actually made a bookmark to go with the blank journals that we put in the brown Aja box. Nice. I like made the bookmark and I wanted to make it as close to the book description as I could. And I couldn't because I don't work in leather, which is what it's made of. So <laughs> it's just a sewn strap. That's weird. Um, but yeah, I was listening to that chapter just the other day. Wait, you're telling me it doesn't actually make books invisible? What kind of... There's also not a secret code about like a secret cabal taking down the government written in it. It's just blank journals. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Ripping people off. 
I know. It's terrible. But yeah, her, her whole story is just wonderfully tragic. Because she's like, I was just really curious and thought maybe I could learn some stuff. And then I was sworn to the devil. It happens. It was it was a day. And then 71 years later, here I am, like, using compulsion on Aes Sedai for the Dragon Reborn. And she thinks in this chapter about her code, her book, and how she needs to write down the encrypt the decryption key. Yes. And, like, get it to somebody. And I'm just like, what happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, I, this is such a good chapter from her. Definitely. Um, she sticks her head out of the tent and sees the, um... Egraine, who has been stilled. Uh, and that yes. makes her, you know, which we do know she gets ends up being healed by Dahmer Flynn. Mm-hmm. So she comes back and, and, and stilling is less of a, an issue. Um, er, Ergine. Ergine. I think is how they say it in the audio book. Gotcha. But yeah, she does get, she gets restored later. She gets restored fully. Mm-hmm. But before that, she makes her peace with her life after being stilled because the Aiel just shove her into their society and say you have a life now deal with it we're going to drag you kicking and screaming back from the edge of despondency um so she gets that first before getting healed it's interesting to me that we've seen a lot of still characters who do come back and survive um it it sort of makes me wonder if the Aes Sedai have been condemning the stilled sisters to death by simply abandoning them and if they just included them in life uh they could have continued to be like productive it's like just because they lost the power doesn't mean they can't be decent people and are doomed to suicide. It's just the fact that you reject them and treat them like crap. And, it, and you know, we, we see this with, um, you know, kids who, LGBT kids who come out to their parents and are, like, uh, thrown out of their home. Uh, the suicide rates go way up, you know, and it's, it's mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, it's almost like having a support network is really important for mental health, right. especially when you suffer a grievous loss right. or disability. Right. Yeah. It's almost like we're wired for social connection right. and community. Right. And so, ah. yeah, my, I guess my point is that when we see anyone who's, who makes a life for themselves and continues to keep, maintain that social connection, they continue to live. They continue to get support. You know, Loghain, yeah. Loghain goes despondent, but once he is able to be active again and participate in society again he comes back out of it and he's all of a sudden he's like you bastards fuck you right like (laughs) yeah Yeah. it's it's ridiculous to think that people should just survive on their own the eyes to die's way of just casting people out into the cold is like anybody would die Mm -hmm. anybody would turn suicidal well not anybody but like so many people would find that to be a situation too terrible to live through for the first months to years but like Mm -hmm. community family people who refuse to take no for an answer like this gets people through a lot of terrible things and yeah we see it in the books time and again that that's how people get through even Mm -hmm. before the apocalypse satala anon being a great example because jasper was just like no Mm -hmm. poor little kitten let me take care of you and it's like yeah the the aes sedai are like Gee, I guess we'll never figure out how to deal with that because we're horrified to study it. Right. And it's just but so, some serious ostrich bullshit. So few people have actually been stilled and, you know, pretty much, to be honest, how many have we seen actually commit suicide? Zero. <laughs> right. Like, well, there's uh, Owen. Owen is stilled mm-hmm. and then commits suicide. And then his wife follows him right. because she wasn't stilled. She just had everything taken away brutally and was given no support right. and was ostracized and treated like, you know, an outsider. So and that's the other thing is the majority of the people who die of being stilled are men. And there's a huge stigma against channeling men. Nobody's going to want to give them a good mm-hmm. life. They deserve whatever they get anyway. The women who get stilled fall through that weird institutional blindness. But the men, it's like, oops. Oops. Which is sad. But it makes sense with the way that they operate. So two wise ones come to pick up Turana and Link to shield her. Which is something that Varen is sure they had not known only a few days ago. Mm-hmm. Where did they learn that from? 
I don't know. It's not Varen, obviously, and it's not the Aes Sedai who comes next, obviously, because they talk about it. Um, Was it Codswain? Didn't Codswain show Cerulea how to link? And she's only been here for three days. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's long enough. And there's that whole thing where Cerulea shows her how to make gateways as a sign of trust right. later. That's later. So yeah. I don't think that, that that linking is something that she would have shared yet. That was that I was thinking that that was the scene where she shared that information. Yeah, that's no, later. that's and that's for gateways. Mm -hmm. So I um, yeah, I, I really had some trouble figuring out. Um, let's just see if what wiki happens mm -hmm. to have that question answered take a quick cause... quick pause and do oops now you're seeing my web page oh that's not how you spell the word link <laughs> <laughs> link What well, he is not responding to my very direct question. That's rude. Um, what encyclopedia says most likely it was Egwene who was teaching the wise ones in return for their help. Mm. So that would make a lot of sense because yeah. we know Egwene know how to link, and I, I was that was going to be my follow up question: is why wouldn't they have known this beforehand when they're working with Egwene? Why wouldn't Egwene have taught them? So I'm guessing perhaps she taught like a meese, and then a meese in this gathering. Oh, uh, that's just the rate the, that it's yeah. filtered out. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't find anything um, in the time it took you to find that. So, yeah, we can just assume osmosis of Egwene's teachings, just capillary actioning mm -hmm. through <laughs> the yeah. way information does. Yeah, so she's... So Varen sends Tirana off. Right, because she's... she's... She's given her the compulsion. Mm -hmm. She's given her some false hope. She's given her some empty... <laughs> empty hope more than false hope. Um, and then sends her off and gets a moment to herself mm -hmm. before the next Aes Sedai gets brought in. Makes a few notes, thinks about Codswain, um, and even the believable parts of the legend made her very dangerous indeed. Dangerous and unpredictable. All very true. Um, especially with that Peralis net that we've talked about repeatedly. Like, And her question is our question. Yeah. What is Codswain after? Like, it's still, even for so many rereads, sometimes it's hard to tell if Cad Swain is after what you think she's after. And, and I think she is. Cad Swain is one of the few Aes Sedai who's actually after saving the world. Like, that's, <laughs> like, that is, to be honest, like, her motivation is actually ridiculously simple. She wants Rand to, to be capable of saving the world. And the man she sees who is angry and brittle and broken and Darth Rand is not the person who can do that. And she's testing him and poking him and prodding him and bullying him to try and get some sort of reaction out of him. Because it turns out treating him like a normal human being uh, is simply sending him deeper into his despair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at the end you see that. But mm -hmm. her behavior throughout sometimes is like, hmm. So Varen sees that. Varen is confused by that. Yeah. Um, and then Aaron comes right. in, right? And and this this is important. It's very important. Important stuff because we learn how Varen's been keeping her notes. They're gibberish sentences about flowers and insects, and it could just at a glance be her her travel notes because she's a brown, and of course she takes naturalist notes. But it's actually, if you read it, gibberish, right? Because it's actually her taking notes on everything to do with the Black Aja and dark friendery in general. And this is her life's work. It's her actual life's work. She's got actually a whole room full of these books. Mm -hmm. What she gives Egwene is the, the most important Cliff Notes highlights reel. But she's got a room full of journals in which she was observationally taking down field Evidence notes. Evidence and stuff like that. 
Um, and one day she would have to write out that cipher she used in her notebooks. One day she hoped, but not soon. But not soon. Oh. It's so soon. Because you know that's exactly what's going to happen. Like, she knows that when she writes out that cipher, it's because she's about to take advantage of the last hour of your life uh, loophole in the oath, right? She already knows about that is how she goes down, basically. Yeah. Yeah, she's she hopes to find the oath rod at the right. end, right? She she goes in there hoping that she's going to be able to skirt out of this last one, but she knows that if she writes it down, that that means she's willing to kill herself. Mm-hmm. She's going to try to avoid it, but she will do it if that's what she has to. And she hasn't done it yet. She makes that decision shortly. Mm-hmm. I assume probably when she writes all those notes that she seals up and gives to various people, yes. like to Alana and to Matt. I assume that when she writes those notes. She's also writing out the cipher to head to Egwene. I think it's also that she sees someone who can use that information effectively, right? She's like, I don't know what to do with this. I really don't. So I'm giving it. I need an Omerlin to give it to. Exactly. And she hasn't had one for a while, right? Elida is certainly not an option. Right. And Swan doesn't have the power Mm -hmm. she does. And so, yeah, no, that makes sense. She's like, the only person I could give this to is an Omerlin that I trust. Anyone else, it won't go over. I guess Cad Swain, honestly, would probably be the the rebel solo Omerlin character to give it to. But Varen doesn't want to no. do that. She's not sure of Cad Swain until the very end, no. pretty much. Yeah, they're definitely looking at each other going, I don't know about you. <laughs> Rightly yeah. so, I think, in both cases. Yeah, no, it's a very territorial thing of, like, I am a very old, very wise, very long view eyes to die, and you look to be poaching on my Dragon Reborn plans. (laughs) So we're going to need to work this out. Mm. Meanwhile, Soraleus, like, I will cut both of you. (laughs) And I'll especially cut the the embassy because they kidnapped Rand. Um, Right. Not so upset that they beat him. No, the AL don't seem to have a problem with beatings. For some reason, no and torture. Their corporal punishment mm. to them is h- how you do. Right. So, yeah, but they but viola- breaking the word. They violated honor. They they mm. have toe. Yeah, toe that cannot be repaid. Cannot. <laughs> I love Varen's POV. Varen blinked up at her, trying to appear open and meek. She must not forget meek, docile, and compliant. She did not, and followed immediately by, she did not feel fear. It's like, oh my yeah. God, Karen. <laughs> Such a badass. Let, yes, I know. Uh, whatever you want. Yeah, whatever, go away. I, I, you know, she's just so practical. Uh, yeah. I saw. She's like deliberately giving bemused glances and curtsying too mm-hmm. much. And meanwhile, she's just like, oh my God, get out of my hair. Mm-hmm. I have such bigger things to do. You were just an obstacle. I saw a video this morning of a uh, guy tried to rob, rob an Uber driver. He was like, give me your cash. And the Uber driver was like, get out. It's digital currency, man. I don't have any cash. Get out of my car. <laughs> like, get that gun out of my face. You're not getting anything from me. It was just that that sort of vibe from Baron of like. But she's trying so hard to look afraid. Right, right. And totally. flustered and compliant. <laughs> right. And it's just like inside she's just like. like get, that, get that thing out of my face. I got, I got people <laughs> to compel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got people to compel. Um, so then her next subject gets brought, mm-hmm. and it is not who she had asked for, which is a problem. Not necessarily this time, but more so in the she doesn't want to deal with the warders of a green. She doesn't want to deal with the warders. She wants the respect of getting who she asks for, because if they aren't respecting her orders, then that means she's not making the headway she wants and the one she asked for ran away which is a really big problem because she's a fucking dark friend yep black aja and varen knows that Mm -hmm. that's when she says you let her escape she's a red that's not what she means she means she's a black Mm -hmm. and the the circumstances of how she escaped is just a telltale signature to varen and it's like that's the part where you're like this looks like a dark friend attack, and Varen is saying she knows exactly what this mm-hmm. is. Is Varen a dark friend? Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's... But it, it does her honor. The Aiel are like, 
Okay, the fact that you freaked out enough to like snap at us is like, mm. maybe you do care about the car card. She's like freaking out for completely different reasons. She's freaking out because of the black Aja factor, not because of the danger to Rand. I mean, potato, potato, right. two sides of the same coin. But it does earn her a few, a few points, so that's good. And this is also evidence for additional dark friend Aiel in camp, right? Like someone had to slit the throat of the guy Shine and give him the poison. Right, that had mm-hmm. to be someone, and someone who could order a guy shining around. So that would have had to be uh, Aiel. Yeah. But I don't think we any get any evidence of who set this up and who controlled this. No. It was like Melinda's dad, and like there's no. It's just yeah. There's dark no, friend Aiel. No, it's just random dark friend Aiel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I the guy shine clearly was not a dark friend. No. Well. No. Could have been a dark. Could have been. I'm I'm guessing most likely just said someone said here give this serve this to the. Yeah, they were they were killed to cover the tracks, but they probably weren't a dark no. friend. Is just grab the nearest guy, Shine. Have them deliver the poison and kill them so they can't ID you as the person who right. gave them the poison. Exactly, exactly. She was not really constructed for all this bending and bobbing. <laughs> I love little little <laughs> nods to Varen being portly. <laughs> and she's stout. And she's older. I mean, even for an Aes Sedai, she's older. Her knees are like, it's been 300 plus years. Is she? Okay. Or is she, I thought she was middle-aged. For I thought she was like 170 or something like that. I thought she was entirely There's, like. I thought she was. She's got gray hair. Right. And I know that. The dates given for her birth are wildly divergent in the companion in the wiki. Gotcha. The wiki has her being quite young, like only 140, and the companion has her being much older. Um, and she's got gray hair. so. And we do know that only happens when you're quite a bit older as an Aes Sedai. Yeah, I've always mentally been to her as being just a little bit younger than Cad Swain. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm pretty sure that... It, the wiki disagrees with me and because it's wrong. Yeah. Because the wiki has her at like one one fifty one. Yeah, which is just I've definite I remember looking it up in the companion and it's different. Like a lot different. I'm just looking. Everything everything on Varen agrees. Hmm. But well, maybe she's grade young. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but it, that would put her about half her overall age, right? So I would think she would look like 40, 50 at the oldest. I mean, people have gray hair at 40 and 50. Mm-hmm. Those of you who still have hair, um, <laughs> some of us don't have any hair when we get to that age. Uh, well, she's strong enough that she could become very, very old. So there's that. But whatever. I contend that the companion says she's a different age, but whatever. No, I'll have to. <laughs> the companion's often wrong, though. So yeah, yeah, that's true. So I'm just. Whatever. It's it's more or less irrelevant. She is portly and bowing a lot and is not appreciating it. <laughs> it's no longer young, however old she might be. Um, right. Right. Uh, the it's interesting the wise ones don't want to tell Rand that an Aes Sedai escaped. And Varen agrees. Um interesting the the agreeing to hide information from Rand that he doesn't quote unquote need to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting, mm-hmm. interesting one because the Aiel and Varen have different motivations for why they want to keep it a secret, but they're both skirting the gray line morally by not telling him. And can we talk about how Katarine escapes, ends up back in the White Tower, ends up beating Egwene as well? And that, like, Katarine gets to beat both Rand and Egwene and just, like, the amount of people... And put them in small yeah. cells and... Mm. yeah. She's kind of awful. She's kind of one of the more terrible Aes Sedai in the whole series, you know, other than like Leandrin and like Galena, maybe like she's on a level with no, them. Yeah, she's very much on a level with them. She's a mean as a snake, mm-hmm. dark friend in the Red Aja. Right, like, right. She's categorically not a good person. There is that is that is definitely a category of Aes Sedai that like 
we see a lot of the black red aja means the snake yeah women it's a huge category it, they're overrepresented they're very overrepresented yeah which is unfortunate i'm glad we got pavara to balance mm-hmm. out our sense of what a red can be but could someone please give me a scientist white? I would really appreciate that if I could just have Seriously. like a white in the background being like molecules or like valence bonds <laughs> or like something, you know, like give me something that like or or stars, like give me some logic, some science or, you know, chemistry. chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some brown, white. Uh, Mm -hmm. research and development teams in the background would make a lot of sense Mm -hmm. being like we are discovering physics right (laughs) or like like uh, what i would honestly what i would love to see is a white like checking out the um school that Rand creates Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like that's where maybe like tehran real start coming from is like the collaboration between the um the work the the merchants and they're not the merchants the uh, the inventors who like they're oh i want this thing to do that and then the the i said i who are like oh yeah i can totally do that let me let me just channel into oh yeah. man like that's yeah where it, as opposed to the whole like nine as opposed to elaine just sort of whole cloth inventing them from nothing you're like oh yeah make something of the right shape and i'll channel into it like have that collaboration go into the school yeah that's gonna be one of the magical magical wonderful things about the fourth age is going to be that kind of like more open mm-hmm. collaboration less siloing engineering apart from magic and just put the put it all together i totally can see that um being a feature of the fourth age is that kind of innovation especially if brandon sanderson is writing it because <laughs> totally um Here's a badass thought from Baron. Gaining permission to be alone with the prisoners had required nearly as much effort as getting Cerulea and Amis to decide they needed to be questioned. If they ever learned they had been guided to that decision. I mean, that is badass of Baron. Like, that's one of those things where you're like, ooh, how did she do that? I would like to see it. Her her patience, her strategic thought, her ability to anticipate moves within moves. I mean... In- She's way fucking smarter than she gives herself credit for, and it's easy to overlook her. It's really easy to overlook her because she over she deliberately makes herself overlookable. Mm-hmm. And she, I think, genuinely doesn't realize how much of a badass she is. She's just doing her thing. She doesn't think of it as a great grand. She's just like, I'm just a brown sister doing her thing i mean yeah it's a big mission but you know i'm no i'm nothing special it's like Varen, you're the best um so bell dine yeah a green without a warder and a lot of attitude i would rather bleed to death than healed than be healed by you yeah <laughs> yeah that lasts like what four minutes not even yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's she's so proud. Mm-hmm. She's she's a horse girl. We learned that. Oh God, she's a, that explains a horse so much. Girl. Right, right. It explains so much. She's a complete horse girl. Yeah. Um, she's young. She's um. How dare you show a different face to the world? And everyone's like, dude, that's what we do. We show like. <laughs> it's literally <laughs> in the job yeah, description. That's like, <laughs> I'm I'm not who I say I'm doing. I'm I'm bowing down. You know. Yeah, bending like a willow. Right. You've heard this. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, and and Beldine thinks it's all about breaking their spirit. It's all about her. She's still very self centered, mm-hmm. and Varen's like, "You are not the hero of the story, Beldine. Mm-mm. You are collateral damage in the froth that the Dragon Reborn is making of the world. Like, <laughs> get with the program." And she does this whole thing where she talks through what Beldine's been doing today mm-hmm. to like sort of just drive home her shame, literally. I mean, she's basically doing some of the Aiel's work, you know, and being like, okay, so your your clothes are clean, but your body's dirty. So that means that you're sunburned and dirty all over your whole body. This is and... that scene in Sherlock Holmes when he walks in and goes, oh, you're an undertaker. And you're like, well, how do you know? When he gives all the reasons that like, 
He yeah. can just like name off the professions of everyone in the bar because he can look at them and see all the various details. And it's like it's one way to show your character is smart is have them notice all the little details and come to a conclusion that is not obvious to everybody else just based on just mundane things. And I think he, he does mm-hmm. it very well here. Totally. He makes Varen look very smart. <laughs> because she is. Because she is. <laughs> um, she talks a little bit about Taviranus and being forced to swear and how that came on her so um, unexpectedly. Uh, I did notice that she has a Terong, or an Angriol, at least. Yes, I wanted to talk about mm-hmm. this uh, because there's two two bits of two mentions to it mm-hmm. of it, and it's this is this is how Varen is above and beyond what everyone thinks she is. Fundamentally, this is what makes her able to do that with the other eyes to die mm. and be just a little bit more, just a little bit more, because she's on her natural strength. She's not low. She's not like no. the highest at all right but she's no she's like second tier ish second tier white tower yeah 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 pre super girls right <laughs> uh, but yeah she's so she's up there but this thing she's had for nearly 50 years so she found it well into her dark friend mm-hmm. career mm-hmm. she got through the first 20 something years of her dark friendery without this thing but once she got this things got easier for her mm-hmm. like cuz she's now able to use enough power to do compulsion. Right. She's not quite strong enough without this brooch. This makes all the difference for her. And I like that. Yeah. I don't know why I like that, but it's just like nobody suspects she could do this because she literally can't. Right. Right. Yeah. And, the, and that wondering where she came across that on real, but the assumption is that certainly nobody knows she has it. I would assume she found it out in the wild rather than in the tower. Or took it off of somebody in the tower. Maybe. You know. But I always assume she found it, like, wandering in the Black Hills, so to speak. I often wonder how many of the lost Aaron Creole are just recovered by a different sister. And they're just sitting in a different <laughs> sister's quarters. Oh, we lost all these Aaron Creole. I don't know. Mm. Don't know what happened to them. And meanwhile, everyone's like, Yep, don't know where that is. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. yeah it, I'm using it. Yeah. It's not lost. I'm using it. Was that, was that the green one or the blue one? Oh, I have no idea where the blue one is. Yeah, no. No, no idea where that one is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, and then, of course, that person dies, and their belongings are just sitting in the corner, and then no one knows what that Angrial is anymore, and then it ends up, you know, in the kin's holding or something like that. Who the hell knows? Yeah, yeah, just in some crate mm-hmm. somewhere at a thrift shop. <laughs> and an occasional sister who died in her sleep with a statue on her undisturbed desk that no one thought was the Angriol she borrowed from another sister. Right. <laughs> I agree, Abigail. That definitely has happened more than once. Or, I mean, dark friend, right? Someone or dies mysterious friend. in the sleep and then you go check their apartment and... The Angriol that they got isn't in there anymore, and no one knows where it is. And, of course, it was covered by the Black Aja, who killed her, and took it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Angriol move around a mm-hmm. lot, I think, for sure. Speaking of which, where do you think Moraine's sist- uh, statue to Angriol is now? Mm. We don't- <laughs> it's one of those things where I- I've looked into it, and it just stops getting mentioned. We don't really get a, a- an idea of where it disappears to, unfortunately. Gets lost somewhere along the way to be found in a few centuries. Yes. Uh, <laughs> then here's a great line that always makes made me go, I don't know if Aaron's this this is really not clear if Aaron's a dark friend. When she talks about a fellow had once told her that she, her smile made him think of his dear mother. She hoped he had not been lying about that at least. He had tried to slide a dagger between her ribs a little later, and her smile had been the last thing he had ever saw. And that's like Okay, she killed the man. <laughs> it was in self-defense, and it's okay to use the power in self-defense. So there's no reason for her to necessarily be a dark friend at that point. However, but she... why was a man trying to kill her? And why did she kill him instead of wrapping him up in flows of air? Right? Yeah, and why does she not think about this in a distressed way? Yeah. Why is she like, yeah, that happened? Yeah. His and... the way Sir Roth talks about assassination attempts, right? 
And that phrasing, his smile had been the last thing he ever saw. You're smiling as you kill him? Right? This is, and also, like, that phrasing is just very much like, that's what happens when evil people kill somebody, right? Like, that is very much in a line that says, Varen is evil right there. Yeah, it sounds like two crooks were meeting and then one tried to double cross the other and one walked away. Yeah. Like, that's what that sounds like. Because that's what <laughs> happened, basically. Yeah. 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 So, oh, the speculation about whether Varen was a dark friend. We all, I mean, we all thought, like, is Varen a dark friend? Yes, but, was like, yes, but her actions don't make sense for a dark friend. Her actions make sense for a purple Aja. They sure do. <laughs> And she has, you know, in the true spirit of the purple Aja, has developed prattling to something of a talent. <laughs> Definitely. I, I can tell you, browns and purples and blacks, they, they all have developed these subterfuges, but Varen, masterclass. Masterclass in prattling. <laughs> um, I love Beldine's conviction that they'll be rescued. It's very similar to <laughs> Galena's, where it's like... The entire White Tower wouldn't do any good. Like, yeah, you're not no. the force you think you are. Just like the White Cloaks aren't the force they think they are. <coughs> like, when they actually go, there's so many other forces in the world. The Aiel, the Shanchan, the Windfinders, the um, Sharans, the freaking converted Dark Friends in the Blight. Like, there's just so many groups of channelers that, yeah, the White Tower is not the badassery that they think they are. And Elida's not going to try to rescue you. No. You're not that high value of a sister to the Amerlin. Like, she's not even going to try. Like, this strategy has nothing to do with it. She doesn't give a fuck. She thinks you deserve this. Her conviction in Elida's care for her is adorable. Mm -hmm. I was like, no. She literally said, fuck those people. Fuck those guys. I don't want them. Like, she's not coming for you. Even if she could, she no. wouldn't. But, of course, the whole conversation is designed to make her despair enough to be healed. Right? To make her be like, yeah, you're screwed. Let me heal you. Yeah, she keeps pushing for that mm -hmm. and being like, here's an uncomfortable fact. Let me give you some comfort. Here's more discomfort. And she's just working her like a good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Um, and then she even brings up the Ashaman right. to like make her unsettled because that scares every woman who can channel. Even Varen, who's like... Who the hell let that get out of control? That never should have been happening. Yuck, but whatever. It's not my circus. But it she brings it up to scare Beldine. Right. Right. Um, and then Beldine finally consents to healing, which is entirely not to heal her. I mean, she gets healed, but Varen's right. doing it it's a to open her up to this um, imperfect compulsion. Right. And it takes a long time. Right. We, it's very complicated. We get a long description. Right. A whole weaving and, and, and about how she cobbled it together from the history of all the various people and how even though it's supposed to work on daddy, for some reason it doesn't. And daddy and boyfriends to get them what she wants. It doesn't work on men. It only works on women because of the trust issues um, and the time. And there's just a lot to that that I didn't, I didn't really feel the need to go too deep into. No, it's, it's yeah. worth just mentioning that this is – a different view of compulsion it lets us kind of see like where it might have come from everything mm -hmm. you said um and it's it's very brute force in a way like yeah. actual compulsion is much quicker and more direct whereas what Varen has to do involves a lot more like manual patches and workarounds um and she like it takes time and it like loosens the tongue while they're going through. Like it's a whole different process. Varen is programming without knowing the API. She has to make exactly. all of her own functions. Yeah, exactly what's mm -hmm. happening here. Whereas Grandal is like you know knows the seventeen different languages that are loaded mm -hmm. up in this thing and can do it in her sleep. It's very very different. Um, but it is it is interesting that there's the two categories of things that people have figured out how to do, which is eavesdropping and mind control. Yeah. Like, those are the two, like, categories that people's minds tend to go to. And the occasional and, uh, healing everybody around you, <coughs> Nynaeve. <laughs> <laughs> just occasionally. Just the, but Nynaeve's little childhood trick of learning to heal. I mean, that's where that, that really becomes a capital T talent for her. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, Varen uses this um, elixir of truth mm -hmm. sort of effect to uh, ask Veldine about if Rand has supporters in the tower because Rand is still operating from that pair of letters from Elida and Alviarin. Right. Which is still assuming that Alviarin is like a, a rebel faction. Like, it, it, mm -hmm. yes, but no. Right. right. <laughs> and and I think this is Varen confirming that that's somehow from the black. That that's somebody who's lying to him, right? Because she's like, who would support him? And she's like, nobody would. And she's gotten no evidence that anyone actually does support him in the tower. There's zero evidence for that whatsoever. So the fact that yeah. he got this letter and is convinced makes her go, yeah, that, that's Black Aja lying to him. Right, right. Yeah, she's she's confirming that it is, in fact, just some random lie rather than, like, an actual thing mm -hmm. that, like, really exists. Um, because, yeah, it's just she can't find any evidence of it. Because mm -hmm. Al Alviar had sent it to him, presumably just to mess with his head and make him vulnerable to other options in the future. Like, it's there's no actual conspiracy backing it up. <laughs> Varen, during this process, mentions a couple of times, if anyone discovers her, she'll be stilled, the full reveal, she's not ready for. Her. And, you know, that is couched in the, oh my gosh, this compulsion is forbidden and therefore would still her. But I think it's also, what she's not saying is, the compulsion would lead to the discovery of being a dark friend. And mm -hmm. that is what would get her stilled. Yep, for sure. For sure. The the compulsion thing itself in normal times, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's the end of the world, so it's the dark friend thing that's higher up on her list of worries, which I think is correct. Mm -hmm. And then one, one of the smartest things I think she says here is um, when she says thinks about it to Viren in the White Tower and how big of a disaster that would be. Well, that's something I think we've speculated about a couple of times or talked about once or twice. It's like, why does nobody like think about how he's such powerfully to Viren? It's not a good idea to store him in the White Tower. To change yeah. chance in the most important place in the world, like, yeah, it's not yeah, good. I mean, they did that with Matt, and it worked out all right. Yeah. But. Yeah. Well, they couldn't keep him. Yeah. Yeah, they couldn't keep him. Yeah. That's true. And he, he was out of there. And he wasn't nearly as strongly Taviran at that point as he is now, or Brand is now. Right, true, true. The Taviran is escalating as it goes. And Rand is, yeah, stronger. So, yeah, it's, of course, Varen would be one of the few people in world to be like, have you thought this through? Yeah. <laughs> Altering chance at the heart of power in the world? Not, not great. Yeah. 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 And, like, we see he, he basically uses that effect when he confronts Egwene in the White Tower. Like, everyone's like, holy crap. Now that's, that's post uh, Veins of Gold, but... Right, and it's a Gwen. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, no, it's it's a very yeah. Putting Rand around that many channelers is gonna produce interesting results, just for sure. Uh, we get the... so. Go ahead. I was gonna say there's there's a great pair of lines here. A great many things had captured her interest over the years, not all strictly approved of by the Tower, and then we get this big long explanation about how the trick works. Curiosity, she thought wryly, working at the weave on Beldine, has made me climb into more than one pickling kettle. <laughs> <laughs> Again, telling you that, like, she has definitely gone too far. Yeah. And ended up as a dark friend on accident. Yeah. Like, it's just telling you right here. 71 years ago, she made a mistake. Curiosity has made her climb into the pickling kettle more than once. She's interested in things that the tower doesn't approve of. Like, If anyone discovers her, she'll be stilled. Like, these are all dark friend agent. thoughts. Yeah, dark friend thoughts, definitely. But but what was so confusing is those all confirmed she was a dark friend, but then she was doing things to help Rand. She was doing things yeah. for the side of the light. And so the whole thing was just like, what the fuck is going on? I don't understand. How can she be a dark friend and also being doing, like, all the best things for Rand? Of, like, doing a better job for Rand than any of his allies. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Varen. Varen. What do you think is the difference between those who think Rand must be kept safe and that the world must be kept safe from him? I feel like this is getting into that territory described by being strong versus being hard. Hmm. I think it's the same kind of philosophical approach to the dragon and the apocalypse that where it's like it's subtle, but it makes all the difference at the end. I see it as those 
yeah, it, it is a subtle difference, but it's those who, the ones who want to keep the world safe are like, well, the dragon is going to be there to fight the battle no matter what we do. So all we have to do is minimize his impact because he's going to break the world. And then throw him, and then throw him at the Dark One at the last battle. Like, I see those as being very conservative, right? Keep things everything the way they are. Don't change anything. Keep the world safe. Mm-hmm. The ones who want to keep Rand safe see him as a valuable asset in the last battle and want to make sure that he's there and that he's going to be um, able to do what he wants to do. They both want to use him. Mm-hmm. But I do think the ones who at least want to keep him safe see that as see Rand as someone who will actually lead the last battle as opposed to just cannon fodder who the Dark One has to like who has to be there at the last battle. Right. Kind of the difference between seeing him as a savior versus a sacrificial lamb. Exactly. Yep. Very much so. Right? If you have a, if you have a sacrificial lamb, you want it, you know, you just put it in a cage and don't want it to like eat nations. <laughs> right. Like, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> Not get killed wandering around randomly exactly. in some city. Right, right. But if you see someone as a savior, they need to be able to build up armies and, and have um, allies and that, and that sort of thing. Right. Have loyalty mm-hmm. from the soldiers, be able to direct battles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes sense. And that's what Moraine has always seen that as like, well, I need Rand to be powerful. I need him to build up. Now, and, and I think on, on the other hand, the Dark One wants the same thing, right? Because he wants a powerful Rand that can destroy the world. Adversary. Yeah. Adversary. So. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it's funny. Rand almost is forced to become more powerful by everybody all around him. That everybody wants him to be more powerful, dark and light. Yeah, nobody wants him to be uh, chill and normal and functional. Mm-mm. We don't want that. Dead, maybe. Dead, maybe, possibly at the appointed time. Right. Not, not too soon. <laughs> um. So we see sort of the compulsion. You know, she. Creates the weave, halfway collapses it, embeds the sort of instructions in it, and then fully collapses it. Uh, it's a very interesting mm-hmm. visual process. I hope that they find a way to incorporate this into the show. I do too. Because it's a very cool visual description of channeling that we don't get a mm-hmm. lot of, like, head stuff channeling descriptions. And, like, I don't care where you copy and paste this event in the series sure. just keep this sequence of events have and have a sort of it gives us a, a, a like i said a programming view of how it works like here's yeah. the program here's the variables here's you the, open the command yeah. line enter your instructions right. hit enter <laughs> yeah i know that's a vastly oversimplified version but mm-hmm. for all the people who don't speak programming in the audience but yeah it, it's very much like she installed a uh you know um she jailbroke her brain and was able to open up the terminal command and type in like instructions. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's always harder than just running the programs to begin with. So, yeah. So it's, it's neat visually. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. And then she, she throws these instructions into Beldine and has to hope for the best. She doesn't know what's going to happen. She just knows that she has now implanted certain instructions in Beldine that Beldine will figure out how to enact in her own way on her own timeline and i think that is the um the meaning of min's vision when she says they have they will each serve serve you in her her own way that there's a certain amount that it's that own way is where the compulsion comes in is they have to find their own way to serve right and then people like elza right like they serve rand to get him to the correct point to die right right like she is serving in her own way she is loyal because of the compulsion but she is loyal to her own interpretation of what's going on not to what rand actually wants right right and that's where we go back to the those who want to protect him versus those that want to protect the world from him right like why do they want to do that well they can each find their own particular opinions Mm -hmm. mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. This it's because it's compulsion light, right? Like y- you have to bring something to it a little right, bit. It's right. not a straight override of your personality. It incorporates into you. Yeah, if you don't want, in a way, it's almost more insidious because, like, I feel like the other one you can fight better, but with this one, you you find your own motivation, and then that's really hard to break if you have your own motivation, right? Like, if if. <sighs> 
So Samuel I've, could have done this on more gays, and she found her own motivation to love him. Robin, but Robin, yes, sorry. Um, but so so I've been listening to um, Behind the Bastards podcast, and the one that came out uh, this week is about Amway. Fuck Amway. And <laughs> and they're what? Fuck Amway. Yes. And they're talking about how that is exactly how a lot of people got addicted to it was because the whole it's about the amount of work you put in and that's how you're going to get rich. Like that ends up getting into people's heads that they want this and that they need to work harder for it. And if they just commit a little harder to it, then they'll get their rewards out. So it's what you're saying. It's this insidious thing where they become their own motivator to mm-hmm. stay trapped in the cult of Amway and it it's less about the promotional materials and more about the mindset that people are then tricking themselves into it. The promotional materials, yes, absolutely is brainwashing people, but that was exactly the part of the podcast I was at when I paused to come do this. Nice. Um, was talking about just this hellscape that people get sucked into, this cultish hellscape of motivating themselves to beat up on themselves for not selling more Amway. And it's just, it's really really fucked up highly recommend the podcast if you want to hear about terrible people and terrible institutions mlms should be outlawed i don't understand why the pure we're letting those pyramid schemes exist <laughs> the freaky thing about it is amway is legally not a pyramid scheme right it's the the story is so fucked up about how that's all going down um, it's just a scheme it's shaped the worst. like a triangle <laughs> it happens to be shaped like a triangle right. it's a pure coincidence pure i swear coincidence. Not, not, <laughs> Just not, and it's not a scheme. It's a, it's a plan with shenanigans. Yeah, it's and and the way that it's deeply tied to the rise of the problematic right, mm-hmm. the really really scary right wing side of politics that has erupted in the last however many years you want to say, but not that many years. Like it's deeply rooted in the way money has flowed from the top of that coincidentally pyramid shaped uh, plan. There's a, some deeply interesting political and social connections to what is ostensibly just a horrible scam. Um, that money went places <laughs> that are deeply troubling, but we're deeply off topic. Definitely. Let's um, let's get Beldine out of here. She's been yeah. compelled. Uh, okay. She knocked over a pitcher of water. I love that yes. little undercut where she's like, oh, I need another pitcher of water. Beldine knocked over hers. And the Aiello is like, oh, oh, you're going to pay for that. <laughs> Like, yeah yeah it's cruel. it's cruel it's so cruel but it it makes Beldine motivated to find her reasoning that much sooner exactly so all to the greater good <laughs> that's that's Varen's entire mission is like this is all to the greater good it's gonna help Brand eventually so she does she it. wants to shame them just as much as the Aiel do yeah I think it's interesting that she says none surpasses her at delving because she is <clears throat> not a yellow nope how is she the best at delving if she's not a yellow? Like, why why are you a brown if you have proficiency at a healing weave? Because she's no good at healing. She can... Well, then why is she good at delving? Because delving, <laughs> she's bad at healing. Because delving doesn't just tell you about someone's sick. It also tells you about weaves that are on them. It tells you a lot more than just their health. Hmm. Oh, okay. I, 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 I like... Uh, Cardizar says she's the greatest at learning, and that's why she's good at delving because that's your learning about <laughs> because a person's how you body. learn about. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So th- think about books, right? Browns are really good at delving novels. Okay. Yeah. No. I. I... And so imagine okay. reading someone's body just like that, right? Like you may not be that practical at the knowledge. You know, you may not be able to read a book about my bicycle or motorcycle repair and repair a motorcycle, but. You're very good at acquiring that knowledge and advising someone and looking things up. And if someone asks you what wrench is the right wrench to use in a, you know, in the situation, you might be able to tell them. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. I, I will accept that. She's good at learning about people mm-hmm. as she is about everything else. And that's why she's good at delving. I, I like that. Head cannon established. <laughs> Doesn't know what to do with that knowledge. That's why she has to hand it <laughs> off to Egwene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, should we move on to Moradin? Uh, yeah, just uh, 
I just want to read the final paragraph with her because it's oh so yeah, good. with a sigh she turned back to Coram. When Medan returns, would you do tell Kalinda that I would like to see Igrain Fatamed? Wow, that is a name salad sentence. Those are four names that I do not know, um, <laughs> or, or wouldn't have known before this chapter. The pain in her muscles tomorrow would be a small penance for Beldine suffering over that spilled water, but that was not why she did it, or even her curiosity, really. She still had a task. Somehow she had to keep young Rand alive until it was time for him to die. And again, dark friend vibes. Big dark friend vibes. Keeping him alive until, right? It's not keeping him alive. It's not for his own good. She's not there for Rand. She's not there to do. She just wants to get him to the last battle. Yeah. And in that paragraph just above it, she's thinking about how she would have like married that cute boy right. and died in far matting. And it's like, and instead you've lived to help get the dragon reborn to his appointed death place. Yep. Like she has the exact same attitude of El as Elsa. Keep him alive until it's time for the dark one to kill him. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a dark friend. Mm -hmm. It's a dark friend plan. Um, <laughs> but it's also yeah. Moraine's plan, as Will points out. It, it is, yes. Sometimes the dark and the light want the exact same things. I will mention, I uh, I watched Ghostbusters uh, yesterday with Never. Mm. Um, so there is no Dana, only Zool. Well, hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I saw that quote and I, it was just in my head. I was like, it, I saw it coming and I was like, ah, Zool. <laughs> Dana, this is her, her line. Yeah. <clears throat> also, the name here for who Varen would have married, Edwin, you think that's why she calls herself Edwina when she goes undercover in Far Matting? Oh, nice catch. I never would have thought about that. I've always I wonder about it and then this name comes by and I forget and I'm like no that that's she's when she's back in farm adding undercover not wanting to go as her name she poses as the woman she could have been mm. the woman and she it, would have been if she'd gotten married yeah it breaks my heart a little bit but it's also awesome because like you know Edwin is like didn't so far in the grave right he's right, dead right. a long time ago but she's like remembering him. It's a little bit like how Rose takes on Jack's name at the end of Titanic. It's kind of like that, but like with less boats. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask that. Um, yeah, I I honestly do think it's it's more of like, hey, I'm going back to my birthplace. What would my name have been if I would like? Mm -hmm. I would totally have been this person in this place. Yeah, I could have very well have been named Edwina because mm -hmm. Edwin is a boy's name that I like, and I'll just feminize it. Little hat tip to the boy mm -hmm. I almost married. All right, so let's dig into this Morden chapter. Yes, the reason why you have go behind you. <laughs> yes, so there's so much in this segment that I actually do want to take a break and grab some water. Um. Okay. <laughs> That's totally fair. I should probably replenish my water okay. also. So 30 seconds. We'll be right back. Yeah. 45. But, you know. Ugh. Sorry. Sorry. Noise. Sorry. getting a uh, dry throat there <sighs> this is pints for pities well you can't really see it because of the <clears throat> my throat had gotten pretty dry there I've been drinking water this whole time, but I still was like, I'm running kind of low. Like, hmm. Because there's a lot to talk about, and we've gone for an hour and a half already. Already. So definitely a good call on refreshing the water. Actually, I just need to crack this now. So this scene, 
starts off with Moradin. We don't know at this point he's a Shamael, but if you can read this chapter and not, it's almost impossible not to come to that conclusion, right? The fire on the golden marble hearth gave no heat, and the flames did not consume the logs. We only ever see that with Moradin in a dream shard. That is his like signature. We are hanging out with Moradin, we are uh, with uh, Ishamael, Ishamael, whatever you want to call him, right? Like he is, and the reason it has neither windows or doors is he is in a Teleron Riyadh dream shard, right? He's not in the real world. He doesn't like mm-hmm. to hang out in the real world. No, he's in the flesh. He's not dreaming. <clears throat> right, absolutely. But, yeah, he's in the dream world. Um, He's got... Uh, he called himself Morden, and surely no one ever had more right to name himself Death. Which is, again, like... This has got to be the... <clears throat> this has got to be the big bad from Eye of the World. Like, everything about this is the same. Right. And then the more death as death, more din as death. Like, yeah, he th- he he has died. Although the no one else is more right. Well, I don't know. The other people have died and come back. I, I think it has more to do with the fact that he's existed in limbo for 3,000 years. Mm. That's kind of what I always went with that is like he has been alive so long. He's basically dead and has been he's like insane and like. He has been living death for thousands of years. I don't know. I just, I feel like the that 3,000 year thing is mm. more what he's talking about there than the fact that he's literally died. I see him as considering himself Nabliss and the embodiment of the Dark One and the embodiment uh. of death. Yeah, I see that. But there could be a lot. I mean, all of those things together, right? Him, him having died, him being the embodiment of death, um, everything could contribute to that mm-hmm. and yeah he seeks eternal death right as, as yeah. He says, yeah his entire mission in life is to die right. at this point permanently so. yeah um he's got two mind traps which we know we've seen uh Mogedian get mind trapped and we know the other one is sindane and that was done before Mogedian's because she sees him put it under mm-hmm. his shirt and he's already got one so we know that Sindane was mind trapped first. I'll be honest. One of my biggest disappointments is how little we get from Sindane, considering we know she's been around for a while. Like we really don't see her uh, make a lot of effort to do anything until she messes with Perrin in the Dream Shard. But like, it would be cool to see her. What what is her mission? Right? He's clearly sent her off to do something. It's not like he's like, oh yeah, you're here to you know, hang around and be pretty. Right, because she's not even that. There's a really. certain amount of control mm-hmm. of like I'm commanding you, and you have nothing important to do. You know, he sends the two of them on errands to like bring the other Forsaken in, and then go stand in the corner because that's all they're good for. Get me coffee. Yeah, there's a bit of that to like rub their faces in how far they have fallen, especially Lanfear. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I was glad when Brandon Sanderson really like used. Sindane to show us how epic Perrin was in the dream world. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. That, that was well done. <laughs> that was very well done. But yeah, it, the way that Moradin was planning on using them was very... It, like, she had to go off and become a rogue agent to do anything interesting. Have you seen Boondock Saints? No. There's a scene where William Defoe, as the FBI agent, walks in and the local you know, Boston PD is trying to solve the crime. And he's like, all right, you fucking morons. Here's what, and he like asks them their opinion and they just get everything wrong. And he's like, here's what actually is going on. Now go get me my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> like, cause that's all you're fucking good for, you know, basically. And that's the same vibe I get from, uh, from Morden is like, oh, oh, you're going to try and stop Randolph Thor. Yeah. You're going to get it wrong. And then you're going to go get my coffee. Cause that's all you're good for. And then I'm going to mm-hmm. mind trap you to make sure you have no choice. Yeah. Um, and so then we are given the names of three different games. Um, Shara'a, Chetren, and Nori. Shara'a is the one that we're seeing here, which looks like a more complex chess, right? Yeah, 33 pieces on in red side. and green on a 13 by 13 grid. 
So a normal chessboard is 8x8, eight eight, right? So 13x13 13 13 is quite a bit bigger. That's a lot bigger. That's a lot bigger. Like, it, especially when you're talking about squaring, you're talking about, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, nearly 200 squares as opposed to 64 squares. So And you've got 66 pieces instead of however many are in chess, which is not 66. 32. Okay. Just, yeah. So right. twice the number of pieces. Or 8 times that's 4 a... is 60. Yeah, 32. Yeah, so it's it's a much bigger game, much bigger, and it's game, in red complex. and green rather than black and white. Not that that's particularly relevant, but you have alternating colors. Well, it's I, Christmas colored. Yeah, well, I I think it's what he's trying to show is there's not a good and a bad side to this. That like it is a matter of mm. perspective. Um, because mm -hmm. we can talk about it, but the Shara game is everything he talks about is an analogy for the first six, seven books of the series and what he tries to do and his relationship with Rand. Oh, really? I hadn't thought of it like that. Oh, oh, we've got some education then. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, because line by line we need to go through this. So we'll, we'll talk about the three games. Okay. Um, Nori is go, is go right? N -O right, right, yeah. apostrophe R-I. That's just the game. That's stones that we see them playing a right. lot. So which that's... is go, which is the picture behind you, right. which is a minute to learn, a lifetime to master. It's very fun. It's very fun. Um, and then and the other one is just chess, just more complex. Um but I wasn't able to find any information on Tetran. Charon? Charon. I, yeah. I don't I don't know. I think the T is Char uh, Charon. Yeah. I think is how they say it in the audiobook. I think. Um so there's no information yeah. about that at all? Uh, it says it's a derivative of Shara and not much is known other than it's just a strategic board game and it's simpler. So what I'm thinking in my head canon, I don't have proof of this, is that's chess as we know it. That was where my mind was going yeah. to. A simplified version is like, so chess. So chess, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So, yeah, no, I dig it. Yeah. And Charon, chess, right? That CH, right? That makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense that mm -hmm. that's where he's going with that. He had, you, you know, the silent T and then CH, yeah. CHE even. Yeah, that to me, that middle game is just chess. Um, yeah. So we've got the full game that he's sort of describing chess and then go. Yes. That's, that, those are the three games. Um, and so what we have to talk about is the description of the game and how that basically describes the first seven books of the series. Okay. The first object of the game was the capture of the Fisher. The Fisher King, in this case, is, of course, Rand. Mm -hmm. So the first object is always to capture Rand. So in book one, through two, book one and two, he's trying to capture Rand, right? That's what he's trying to do. That's how he's trying to start the game. Um, the, and, and then he goes on to describe the fissure. And so this is, this is sort of what goes on. On a white square, it's weak in attack, yet agile and far-ranging on escape. This is Rand as a fugitive without a lot of power, without a lot of allies. He is far-ranging in escape. He's hard to pin down, um, but weak in attack. He doesn't have a lot of power, um, can't really do anything to combat. On black, he's strong on attack, but slow and vulnerable. This is Rand as a king. In the Stone of Tear. In the Stone of leading Tear. the Aiel. Mm -hmm. So he can't move very quick because he have, has armies, but he can attack and, and cause damage. And he's hard to attack yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting. He says black and white square, but I thought this was a green and red board. I think just the end rows are green and red. I think the board itself is black and white. Yeah, and I think you're right. It's green yeah. and red around the edge and then black and white in mm -hmm. the in the board itself. You're right. Everyone who was writing us an email telling us we were wrong, <laughs> you can put your keyboards down. We fixed it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. You've got the end goal row that only the fisher can move on to. That's, so that's sort of like Rand being king or, or whatever. Um, when the fisher was yours, you tried to move him onto a square of your color behind your opponent's end of the board. So essentially you, you, know, you take the opponent, right? If you have Rand mm -hmm. in your control and you defeat the enemy, that's what that is. You beat the enemy. That's sort of a straightforward victory. That was victory the easiest way, but not the only one. When your opponent held the fissure, you attempted to leave no choice but for the fissure to move onto your color. That, to me, is corrupting Rand. That, to me, is where he's trying to convert Rand to be dark. And that's where 
um, holding the fissure could be more, more dangerous than not, right? That's what ran, that's veins of gold. Rand was about to destroy the world, right? At some point, the fissure being on our side wasn't necessarily a good thing. Rand being good isn't helpful. You can force him to do bad things. You can force him to attack his own forces. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the third path to victory, um, if you took it before letting yourself be trapped, I assume that's just eliminating all of the other pieces. Mm-hmm. That degenerated into a bloody melee. Victory coming only with complete annihilation of your enemy. He tried that once in desperation, but the attempt had fa- failed painfully. So again, this is sort of what links him to the real world. That attempt was the end of the third book. That's mm-hmm. when he attempted to attack Rand straight out and died. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, trying to take out all of his allies and setting everything mm-hmm. up so he could take him out. And it still didn't work. And it still didn't work. And so then what's, what basically happened is that took... I really should have said that was a summary of the first three, not the first six, because then Moradin Ishamael t- was taken off the board, and now he's coming back. Mm-hmm. And he's trying a different strategy. Yeah. I'm, I'm really digging this analogy, because I'm looking back, too, that the first object was to capture the fissure. Only then did the game truly begin. Mm-hmm. Like, that's book one. Like, first you have to find Rand, get him on the board, get him out of the two rivers and moving and vulnerable... And now the game starts. And then this other line, um, when Masters played, the Fisher changed sides many times before the end. Like, is it this is Rance changing allegiances and mental states and loose Theron and being misguided and, and going, going from, his own way. And going from white to black, being, you know, like when he's wide ranging and far ranging escape, that's the dragon reborn, you know, and then you've got all these other fights. Yeah, there's so much here that the analogy of Shara, Shara uh, and Rand's fight with Moradin in the Dark One, like this is all an analogy for the, the oh. battle. I never saw that at all. I thought it was just some, you know, Ishamael's going off about a thousand times a thousand philosophical wandering, whatever. Mm -hmm. I did not even think to see it as an analogy for the story that we've been witnessing and will continue to witness. Yeah, this is this is one hundred percent. That's one of why it's such my favorite scene of mine is because this is more than describing the book so far and how and his strategy in fighting Rand as Ishamael. And, oh, this is such a deeper POV than I thought it was. Oh, yeah. No, this is one of my favorite POVs. <laughs> this, is, this is, in this book, this might be like these two. Again, I didn't realize how short it was because there's so much here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it sets you up to be like, okay, here's the man sitting across the board from Rand. Here's the person who's playing the game across from Rand, trying to manipulate him, trying to control him. Um, and it's why, it's why at the end when Rand just is like, nah, nah, we're taking over your body and you don't, you don't matter. I'm fighting the dark one. It's like, (laughs) Shamael sees himself as the player, but he is just a piece on the board. The ultimate puppet. Yeah. The ultimate tool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny. He's, uh, telling on himself in many ways in this Mm -hmm. chapter being like, isn't this a clever way to exist? I'm clearly the one in charge. It's like, are you, are are you, Are, are you there? Are you sure about that? Or maybe you're just seeing how the game is played with more insight than most. I mean, you're still a piece. Um, I did want to mention the servants. The servants, we do get a, a description of. They are, in fact, Shadow Spawn. They Zomara, are not... right? Zomar, yeah. They're, they can read minds. They can't talk. There's a whole... And every, they forget anything that they know within minutes. But they're just like these, these perfect servants that... I think maybe Grendel talks about them quite, quite a bit. Yeah, somebody does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're very creepy ultimate servants. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, super, super creepy. But it's yeah. you need a certain kind of automaton when you want staff at like dark friend events. And, or, yeah. And we also hear that this is, again, a sign of a Shamael. He's the one who uses them. Mm-hmm. Right. He's the right. only one who really likes Because they're creepy. Nobody right. wants to be around them except for the guy who's like literally named himself Death because he's so fucking mm. emo. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's emo a former baby. angsty emo kid. I feel like I have the right mm-hmm. to make that joke. <laughs> yeah, they're at the Dark Friend Social. Oh, yeah, they are. They show up at a couple of different gatherings. 
And they're creepy every time. Every time. Prob- they're kind of like a golem, but just with less ability to kill you and more ability to anticipate if you need your wine refilled. But they're kind of in that same like weird like Plato soulless uh, kind of thing, or like Greyman. That's Men. interesting. I would uh, gray more Greyman than the Golem because I think yeah. the Golem has a soul. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I'm thinking more of Greyman because the Golem it's too intelligent, it's too active, it's too dynamic not to have a soul. Yeah, you can give it a mission and it mm-hmm. will figure out how to achieve the mission. Whereas a gray man will walk through a wall. Or just stand there stuck like a video game character. Just like, right. doink, 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 doink. Right. Yeah, I always found them, yes, they can get through, but they're very simplistic creatures, right? They're they're never, right. once yeah. you see a gray man, no one's like, oh, no, how do we take down this gray man? They're like, oh, yeah, stab. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, it's, it's seeing it that's the trick. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, the Zamara are probably more, like, in that category. But they're like the Golom, I think, in the sense that they are not made from humans who sacrifice their bodies. Like gray men are, mm. gray men actually give up their souls. Whereas right, right. the golem was made whole cloth out of something. I the, suspect the Zamara are also made up whole cloth because they are identical. Yeah, exactly. There, there's no each Zamara is exactly like the rest of them. There's no like variation among them. Right. I mean, gray men are oddly plain. So, mm. but, but we canonically know that gray men are humans who give up their right. souls. Which uh, is and, and I imagine weird. the giving up of your soul is what makes you plain. It doesn't matter what you look like. Once you give up your soul, right. you look very plain and boring, and right, the people who are soulless and have had their souls sucked out of them are much less interesting to talk to, yeah, than people who are you know still having some spark of life in them. So yeah, no, I can see that. The whole beauty is inner thing and this confidence that is attractive. Like mm-hmm. the gray men are just the ultimate expression of that. Right, right, and then they just. It's almost a side effect that they can't be seen. It's like, oh, we suck out their souls. And yeah, they can't really be seen. They're just so boring. Like, they don't yeah. even attract your attention. Have you read um, His Dark Materials? Yeah. So, like, uh, how Will and the witches disappear. Mm-hmm. With the whole just, like, turning attention away mm-hmm. thing. It's it's that. It's literally that mechanism all over again is what you're talking about. And that's a pretty common magical side effect. Is people are like, oh, I'm not invisible. You just don't see me. Right. Which, I mean, you, you can do in in real life i've I've done it it's not hard (laughs) i love the psychological experiments where like they'll have someone come up to a counter and they'll have one person like be talking to you and they'll duck down to get something and a different person will stand up and continue the conversation and the person talking will not notice that they've switched um you can have different wow. color hats, different color shirts, different people. Like, you can do all sorts of stuff like that. But, like, wow. when you're in that transa- transactional mode, you don't see the person. You see the role. And they can swap people out in that role. And, and it just your mind will just paper that right over. If, if it's in a way that you that your mind doesn't tell you there could be someone else there. Right? Like Right, right, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like how you can be standing right behind someone like in a room and just be very still and they don't expect you to be there. So they mm. don't see you until you move or exactly. make a noise and then they jump out of their skin and it's a whole thing. Yeah, I mean, um, it's where yeah. our mind constructs reality around us. Yeah, in a way. exactly. Like, We're hallucinating everything yeah. and interpolating way too much. Way too much. <laughs> way too it's much. What, what to me is really interesting is how much um, our mind predicts the future. And that's how we that's how we catch balls and stuff like that is like our mind takes what's around us and predicts the future a few seconds. Mm-hmm. And if we fuck that up, a lot, that's why a lot of times, like you don't realize you've been hit or so if someone's punched you, it takes you a little while to register that. You're like, wait, I didn't see it. And you're like, yeah, cause it was unexpected. And your brain, your brain is constructing reality and it takes it a while to actually construct that reality when something unexpected happens. Yeah. Was that way off the path? It made sense, but we are okay. way off the path of we the book. We are way off the path of the book. But it uh, was relevant. It was relevant. <laughs> um, so last two paragraphs, we uh, we get past the thing. Morden gets all pissed, and we see the black flakes, the, the saw yeah. across his eyes. Why? Is he getting furious because Rand is getting furious? Is this one of those things where Rand's emotions are... No, this is before the crossing of the streams. No, this, this is, is after before? crossing this of the streams after? was the last book. That was the... Well, but, okay, I guess we don't actually know when this is, so we should right. assume that it's after. We, we okay. assume it's chronological, yes. Okay, so in that case, this is this Rand's emotion, or is this 
Ishi's emotion. More dude's it, emotion. It very much could be Ran. I mean, Ran's pissed at a lot of things these these days. Um, I mean, I think it's because he's pissed that he got killed, basically. <laughs> like, I think that's that's basically he's thinking about how he died. The, the, oh, that's true. Yeah, he did just think the, about... The yeah. attempt had failed painfully. What What is that? That is the end of the Dragon Reborn when he tries to kill Rand, and instead we find, see his body. Yeah, um, no, it and, just makes sense that in this case it's his anger, because yeah. <laughs> that is a very infuriating thought. Um, yeah. And he seizes the true power and has ecstasy pain almost wash him away and it's very like mm-hmm. sexual drug power thing and the, the saw is another clue that this is uh ishamael right mm-hmm. yeah for sure and that he's the watcher mm-hmm. who like mm-hmm. whether or not you know if the right. watcher is ishi y- you know that this is the watcher that that was a good point that this very much there was a lot of speculation if moradin was the watcher at the end of the last book because that was not made clear and this definitely makes it clear that moradin has the saw um and and it also I forget exactly when we learned that the fire in the eyes and mouth are advanced saw, but uh, I'm not sure if that was something that was confirmed by Jordan himself, uh, or if it's actually in I the books. I think it's canonical when some of the Forsaken are getting together and being like, "Ooh, he's got a lot of saw." Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's some late stage saw. I'm right. pretty sure that we get it in the text in right. that way. That makes sense. Um. So he almost crushes the Corsuvra. Almost crushes the Corsuvra because he's really because pissed. Because piss, you know, breaking mm-hmm. important things when you're pissed off is an adult, healthy mm-hmm. response to anger. Um, the fisher was always worked as a man, a bandage blinding his eyes and one hand pressed to his side, a few drops of blood dripping through his fingers. So foreshadowing the blinding of Rand with the mm-hmm. bandage around his eyes. Also, I just want to talk about the Fisher King and the legend of the Fisher King, right? And yeah, like yeah. How much this has made it explicit that, yeah, Jordan is using the legend of the Fisher King as an analogy for Rand, right? Like, and if you go, there's a great uh, Robin Williams movie um, where he basically plays the Fisher King Mm. and you get a lot of these tropes in there and I need to go back and watch it. I watched it in high school, I think. Um, And I just remember uh sort of learning about the, you know the beggar the beggar king was this thing that the fisher king had become and the 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 wound in the side and the the bad eyesight and one becoming one with the land and all that kind of stuff and i watched this movie of robin williams and i was like that's Rand, that's the dragon reborn you know like i had this moment of course because i read wheel of time first um where i, I, rev- I <laughs> even though obviously these are old legends and he's basing the wheel of time on the legends i i, I saw it the other way um. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the legend of the Fisher King. It's come up sort of randomly occasionally, but mm-hmm. I don't I don't know about it as much as I should for someone who's this into Wheel of Time. Um, I mostly know that there's a lot of weird speculation about there being gay coding in some versions of the legend. Ooh, That's I'll... the main context that I've learned about it in. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I don't know if I remember it well enough to... It was something about, like, he has this wound that causes him great pain that was inflicted by a man, and sometimes he had to have the man stick the spear back into the wound to make the wound feel better. And, like, yeah. I, mm. I learned this a couple of years ago, but apparently there are some interpretations of the Fisher King legends that have some homoeroticism uh, in it, for what that's worth. But that's my main connection to knowing about the Fisher King legend. It's Arthurian, right? Something it is to Arthurian, do with the yeah. grail and stuff. Um, so just just uh, looking it up, um, the Fisher King, wounded king or maimed king, um, is the last in a long bloodline charged with keeping the Holy Grail. Uh, he is already always wounded in the legs or groin and capable of standing. All he, all he is able to do is fish in a small boat on the river near his castle and wait for some noble who might be able to heal him by asking a certain question. In later versions, knights travel from many lands to try and heal them, but only the chosen can accomplish the feat. This is achieved by Percival, alone in the earlier stories, and he is joined by Galahad and Bors in the later ones. Bors? You know, there's a Bors in freaking um, Arthurian legend. And that I didn't right. either. And that, that immediately takes me to... Jake and Jake Carden. And <laughs> We're like, wait, how are we going what? to Jake? How, how are you helping? Get out of here. 
But yeah, you got a boar as the elder and a boar as the younger. Oh, boars um, got killed by the killer rabbit. That that explains mm, it. Okay. That that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this this is where like if you really are deep into the Arthurian legend stuff, you can see a ton of parallels um, with the, the like clearly. Jordan was like had the Arthurian legend book open next to him while he was writing yeah. these series and using I'm, them as a constant, constant reference. Yeah, I'm sure that there is an amazing series of articles on like 13th Depository. If anyone is interested in reading about this, go look this up on 13th Depository because I will bet a significant sum of money that this has already been hashed out by people with way more academic credentials than we have between <laughs> right. us. Right. <laughs> I too have seen... Um, Robin Hood men in tights and that's you know, <laughs> right like, yeah uh, but it's the kind of thing that I know is on 13th depository I don't go to that website very much but I mm -hmm. know that that's the kind of stuff that's there so um definitely go look it up if you're interested but we are not qualified <laughs> for once this is something that's uh out of the scope of this podcast we, which, Ooh, is rare. <laughs> which is rare which is rare which is very rare we go that but but real deep knowledge of Arthurian legends is definitely um part of that category because there's yeah. just so much academic literature about it like because and so much Arthurian legends have led to so many papers and novels and stories that are based around it including the wheel of time right the wheel of time in a lot of ways is derivative of those stories right like so it, it, I can understand where the the area of study is actually encompasses the wheel of time not the other way around mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah. that's why that's why it's out of the scope of this podcast <laughs> yeah for sure but I, I will return us to the book with, it troubles me sometimes, enrages me, what knowledge might be lost in the turnings of the wheel. <laughs> Just taking Moradin's words from my own. Yep. Knowledge that we need. Knowledge we have a right to. A right! I have okay, a right Brown. to this knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel strongly with Moradin. I feel like Moradin and Varen are both, you know, the quest for knowledge. Like, Do you think Moradin They are both on a Brown? quest for knowledge. Well, I mean, obviously he would have been a white because stupid philosophy Fair enough, but that he did he, logic himself out of being alive yeah. yeah but if he could set that aside and just have cognitive dissonance sitting in the back of his head and he followed his passions i do think he would be a brown i think he's much more into applied science than just philosophy i think that's the <laughs> problem he just he majored in the wrong thing that's really his problem <laughs> uh you know th there is a certain amount of um mental health you have to be careful about when you're looking in philosophy and, and when you're thinking about thinking it can be dangerous it can lead you down some dark paths yeah Meta and there are... metacognition as we say <laughs> and there's something to be said for taking that alertness into studying the natural world mm -hmm. sometimes learning what we do know or what we don't know or it, what we don't know can be quite disturbing we don't know yeah. how gravity works like no, we don't all. really know how like, so much about the world works or we do know how the world works and we know that we're causing climate change. Let me let me know we're if gonna you come up with a theory anyway. of quantum gravity. I'd love to hear that one. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's yeah. Philosophy is is angst about yourself and natural science is angst about the world. And you you have to learn to live with a certain amount of cognitive dissonance to sustain your mental health while really studying these subjects. No, no like, I don't. And I can totally. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's where I live. Um, trying not to get anxious about the world around us. It's, there is a certain amount of like, yeah, if I think about it too hard, uh, there is a certain amount of like, well, what's the point? I should yeah. just curl up and stop producing carbon by, you know, not eating anymore and yeah that will t solve all my problems uh <laughs> it, it is that, a tension we get to live with yeah it, yeah and it's just like oh moradin went too far down that path no you don't you don't walk down that path it doesn't make sense because then why are you doing anything at all mm -hmm. yeah yeah if the earth is just gonna live anyway why bother trying to make it better right <laughs> uh, anyhow uh. So we finish up with this uh, memory of a memory of Randolph Thor, which is that sort of the foreshadowing of saying, yes, the Fisher King with the wound in the side and the blindness is definitely, and uh, perhaps one hand. Um, it does say one hand pressed to his side, but we don't know where the other hand is. <laughs> uh, 
And I think just the term one hand really caught my eye there. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was assumed he had a hand on a staff, but yeah, it doesn't yep. actually say either no. way. Uh, and then we get one of the coolest lines that totally. I have applied to, to my life, to so many situations. It was very hard to lose a game when you played both sides of the board. Like, this is just life advice. It's one of those, like, follow the money questions. Like, <laughs> who profits? Who's playing against who? Yeah. Because it's very hard to lose mm-hmm. if you're playing both sides. So just a little perspective. And then the final sentence. Morden laughed so hard that tears rolled down his face, but he was not aware of them. Rand in the box, crying, laughing so hard he cried. Pray I know that's that a little, yeah. More death remembers laughter and tears. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, there's a little bit of crossover going. Is it possible that through the crossover, Rand's madness was mitigated a little bit because it was shared with Morden, and Morden was able to absorb some of that tainted madness? But Morden's kind of insane also. Right. So it might just be equalizing insanities between the two. <laughs> They're just both insane. That I never thought about the fact that Morden also is insane, and that might be affecting Rand's insanity. That it's yeah. like, it's it's really tough to pin down how much of the emotions are shared and how much is is going in one direction or the other. Um, simply because I think there's um, we don't get a lot of POVs from Morden at the same time that we get POVs from Rand, so it's hard to match up. This this is what's yeah. happening when that's happening, right? There's no real way to make that connection. Right. Prove it. And they're, like, processing it in different ways, right? Like, Morden doesn't have an LTT because he knows he's insane, whereas Rand is in denial, so he has an LTT. So, yeah, they're processing it in very different ways. But, yeah, I mean, Rand's having PTSD flashbacks and dissociative episodes. Like, why couldn't some of those, like, bleed off onto Morden? It might not make the pressure any less on Rand. It might be, like, an earthquake fault line where having small earthquakes can actually build up tension rather than bleeding it off. But uh, yeah, I mean, I could totally see Morden suffering some of Rand's trauma and Rand suffering some of Morden's trauma. Like, and maybe it takes the load off sometimes and then piles it on heavier others, or maybe it's just equal all the time. But Morden can't shoulder any of the load, I don't think. He's got plenty of his own to, to deal with. And with that, next chapter, we get to follow the wind. Chapter read one. The, read chapter one and read the paragraph. So I can't wait to do that. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?